Hi, I'm Cody Graham, and today I'll be talking to you about my University of Maryland Robotics project for class ENPM 809C. The project's theme is based around space, influenced by SpaceX's launch of Falcon Heavy. The idea is that the robot that we built has been safely transported to Mars, as well as some construction materials that will be used to build a shelter for humans to live in later. The materials are scattered nearby, so the robot must find the materials, report their positions, and collect them to bring back to the construction zone. Now I'll show the robot I've constructed. This robot has four wheels driven by four motors. I use a single L298N motor controller, which only supports two channels, so the left and right wheels are wired together. The parallel gripper kit A from Servo City is used to pick up construction materials, and has yellow tape to prevent the camera from seeing reflections on the black plastic. The robot is controlled by a Raspberry Pi 3B+. The position of the robot is monitored using call effect sensors as encoders, and the heading of the robot is monitored using a Bosch BNO 055 IMU. The encoders and IMU are read using two Arduino Nanos, and the data is transmitted to the robot using serial communication. An ultrasonic sensor is mounted on the front of the robot to detect walls, and a Raspberry Pi camera module is attached to the front of the robot for computer vision purposes. Early testing showed that when I'm reading in camera data in Python and converting it to a NumPy array, I get a relatively low frame rate as you can see in the video here. In this video, you can see some early OpenCV testing to detect green circles. This early testing was very useful because I had never used OpenCV prior to this class. Once I had some computer vision working, I went to test the drive of the robot. Here you see some basic drive motions that are using full power at all times and have no sensors in order to control the drive motion. Next, I tried using the ultrasonic sensor. In this video, I have the robot drive until it sees a wall within 10 inches. Once I see a wall within 10 inches, I have it back up for a somewhat random amount of time, and then I try again. This test was particularly difficult at one point because the ultrasonic sensor does not always see a response, which means sometimes the program doesn't measure an actual distance. I make up for this by assuming that the distance is large and returning a value of 1000 inches in this scenario. The next test was to run the servo. You can see here that I close the servo and open it back up, and I test it at various duty cycles as shown in the top left corner. Now I want to tie it all together. In the video shown here, the robot will take a picture and wait for me to send a command through the terminal. The command can be forwards, backwards, left, right, grab, or release. It will perform the action until the next time it receives a frame. This is a relatively short amount of time, which gives me fairly fine control. Every frame is saved independently so that it can be put into a video later, which is what you're seeing now. This is not using any sensors, but simply turning motors on and off until the next frame is received, or commanding the servo to open or close. Now it's time to use the encoders. In this clip, you can see the robot driving where the back wheel starts at one marker and ends at the next. This drive was done using encoders, which have 960 encoder counts per revolution meaning the Hall Effect sensor sees 960 transitions between high and low when the wheel spins one revolution. Using the diameter of the wheel, I calculate how many ticks I should see in one inch so that I can tell the robot to drive a specific number of inches. I use the same concept to allow the robot to turn a certain number of degrees based on the encoder. In the video I'm about to show, the robot uses both of these algorithms to drive in a rectangle. As the robot drives around, it's missing some encoder ticks and it's counting extra ticks, so it c gains drift in its knowledge of its position over time. You can see at the end of the video that the robot isn't quite where it started, and it's also facing the wrong angle. It's not a large error, but after driving around for 10 minutes, the error will build up. In order to account for this, I wanted to use an IMU to measure my heading. 
Bosch BNO055 has a built-in Coleman filter, which gives it very accurate, non-drifting heading reading from an IMU. The video shown here is using a proportional controller to hold the robot at the same angle according to the IMU. Because the IMU uses I2C clock stretching, which is a feature that the Raspberry Pi does not support, I had to connect the Raspberry Pi to the IMU through an Arduino Nano, which is transmitting heading data using serial. Using the IMU, I wanted to have the robot track a red object that it knows where the position is using the camera. The camera sees the red object using an HSV color filter and uses the exposition on frame to determine what angle the object is at relative to the robot. The IMU is then used so that we can determine the angle of the object in a global coordinate scale which initializes such that the robot is facing zero at the start of the program. Since it knows the absolute heading, once it tracks the object, even if the object disappears out of frame, it can still track the same heading. As you can see, the robot was facing the object and it remembers where the object last was. So, if I move the robot, it will continue to track that same orientation. Once the object comes back into frame, the robot will start updating the global heading that it should be tracking, and it will continue to track the newly found heading. Now I'll show the first time that my robot ever successfully grabbed one of the blocks. It's the exact same algorithm that I was running in the previous video, however, whenever the object is in frame, in addition to tracking the heading, it adds 30% power to both wheels in order to move towards the object. Once the object is below a certain threshold on screen, the robot believes that it has the object. In order to avoid too quick of a false positive, the object must be below that threshold for multiple frames in a row before the robot will believe that it truly has the object and attempt to grab it. Here you can see the robot drive towards the object, grab it, and bring it back to me. This is all distance based, and once the robot drops off the object, it'll turn around and search for the object again. I place the object back in front of the robot, and once it sees it, it will immediately start tracking again to bring it back to the home base. By remembering every drive motion that I've performed, I can estimate my current robot's position. Using that, I can determine where the home base is and navigate to it directly. Now to show the grand challenge. This video is sped up at 10 times speed. The robot immediately goes to the goal position and begins searching for cubes. The cubes are ranked based on how close they are to the robot, according to the Y position on screen, and how large of a blob past the color filter. Once it locks onto a cube, it also uses the heading of the cube as the third ranking factor. This third ranking factor prevents the robot from being indecisive and turning between two options. Every time it grabs a cube, it emails the teacher with the position of the robot at that time, and then the robot turns back to the home base to drop off the block. It turns around, picks up another cube, and repeats this process, grabbing one green, one red, and one blue at a time, until it can no longer find any cubes. Every time it gets back to the construction zone, it asks the user if it should turn towards a red, a green, or a blue next. Once the user quits the program, it emails the teacher an image of the final trajectory, which can be seen here. In this trajectory, you can see the initial drive of the robot, from the bottom right corner of the field all the way to the goal position. From then, you see it travel to each independent block location, pick it up, and come back. I'm very happy to report that I was able to pick up all 12 blocks. You can see from the chart here that the largest error that I had experienced in my positioning info was 24.9 inches in the x direction. Since the construction zone was square, the magnitude of the error did not matter, but only the maximum error between the x and y direction. My robot had an allowable error of 33 inches before the robot would begin placing objects outside of the construction zone. I've learned a lot about autonomy and maintainable code this semester. Thank you for the fun, difficult challenge, and thank you for watching.